Father. <laughs> yeah, I look back through the congregation, seeing some familiar faces. Walt, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Enjoyed what you had to share about your, your honey. Thank you for sharing. I want you to remember Walt, Katie, and Josh in the days and months ahead. Remember Orpha. Remember all these who the Lord has taken her love on home. She don't need to suffer no more, Walt. Her suffering's over. It's so good to see you here. We want to continue to follow the Lord because we want to see those dear loved ones once again be reunited. Hard thing to explain. Will we know one another? Scripture says we'll know one another as we were known here. We'll be married to the Lamb. Our marital relationship will be different because we'll be married to the Lamb. Looking forward even more so to go to heaven. The order we get, the more, more people we know are there. Some of them sing homesick for heaven. <laughs> when I was young, I didn't want to sing them kind of song. I thought, man, them people are old. <coughs> well, God takes a lot of your friends to heaven. You'll be waiting to go there too someday. Lord, need your help today. Lord, your people need to be encouraged. There's so many of us here that have been affected by you taking our loved one home. Didn't want to see them hang around and suffer anymore. And I'm glad, Lord, you're with you, but you know it's hard. It's difficult to go on. Each and every day seems to be a new challenge. Something different to uh, try to get through. I know, Lord, your word is quick and it's powerful. And I know, Lord, it's able to bring comfort and strength and guidance to each and every one of us. And I ask, Lord, that that's what happens this morning. Let it go forth and accomplish what you want to accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. As the church, we, we celebrate Isaiah's announcement. We do so every Christmas time. The prophet declared that God is going to send his son as the answer to every cry and every prayer. But I believe there's a lot more that's embedded in this verse than we usually associate with the story of the baby in the manger. We're told that Jesus was being sent in human form to unveil God's covenant with man. And we can see that in Isaiah 49 and verse 8. I will give you, meaning referring to Jesus, as a covenant to the people. When God gave us his New Testament or new covenant, he didn't set up a new system of new rules. Instead, he set us a person. Jesus is the covenant that God sent. The old covenant, or the Old Testament, as we refer to it, was certainly a set of rules that were based on certain conditions. It's stated in the Old Testament, if you do this or that, then... God will give you life, but if you don't, you'll miss God's blessing. And of course, the people constantly fell short of God's standards. They were unable to keep His law, which was very holy and pure. And as a result, they were dogged by guilt and shame and despair. And today, we've somehow gotten it in our minds that God's old covenant needed to be worked on. Or as the modern terminology is today, it needed to be tweaked. But Jesus didn't come to try to fix a covenant. 
He came as the covenant. He didn't come to show us the blessing of grace because he is the blessing of grace. Another false image that we've developed is that Christ came as an appeaser between us and an angry father. We see Jesus as someone who is always apologizing for an aging parent. Oh, you have to overlook his gruffiness. He's become kind of cranky in his later years. If you really got to know him, you'd see how loving he really is. Some of us have that conception of that's what Jesus came for the Father. They're both misconceptions. We assume that Jesus came to make the law easier, easier on us, but that's not true either. The truth is that Jesus actually made it harder. He said in one of his sermons, You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say, don't even look at someone lustfully. Or you've already committed adultery. You've heard it said, don't commit murder. But I say, don't even be angry with your brother. If you do, you've already committed murder. Jesus' first act of ministry here on earth was an act of incredible mercy. He was the embodiment of the new covenant. He was showing us the impossibility of our ability to keep God's law. He increased the requirements of the law to show us that we could never do it without His grace and power. We can't do it without Him. I told our young fellows this morning in the Sunday school class, we can't live without the Lord. You can't live without Him. You may try, you might make those decisions and try, but you can't do it. Throughout church history, men like Luther and Calvin and Wesley, they had emphasized how important it was for God's people to understand the New Testament. They saw it as a matter of rightly dividing God's Word to grasp what is law and what is grace. And if we would fail to comprehend this, they said we'd be doomed to a lifetime of despair, and certainly Luther and Wesley had knew this to be true because they had experienced that kind of despair in their own lives. But here's the difference. Under the New Covenant or the New Testament, God's law was no longer an external standard to strive for. Instead, His law would be written on our hearts through the Holy Spirit. God's love has been poured into our hearts. Through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. It is the very life of God himself. And it helps us to obey his word. The Lord loved us and gave himself for us. That we might have this newness of life. I'm going to share with you three accusing voices. That seek to rob us of this kind of life. The first voice or the first accuser appeared in the Garden of Eden. The accuser of our brethren who accuses them before our God day and night. Revelation 12 and verse 10. Satan's accusations are the one thing that Jesus came to deal with. As our living and breathing covenant. In Isaiah chapter 49, God didn't just send a theology to crush his lies. He sent Jesus. And the earliest prophecy we have is found in Genesis chapter 3, in verse 15, that Satan would bruise the Messiah's heel, but Jesus would crush the devil's head, and he did that on Calvary. That's the accuser. He whispers, you're no good. You're worthless. You're a burden to others. Look at your history, how many times you have messed up. You'll never change. Our relationship with that voice began in the Garden of Eden. But when Jesus came, he declared that at, that would end right now. And he ends with a very amazing assurance. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. John 5 and 45. 